Hello, Autist Festival. My name is Tatiana Bilbao, and I'm very happy to be here with you. Today, I thought I'd speak a little bit about the house. I believe it's a fundamental architectural component that has structured our everyday lives and defines the relationship between our bodies and other people. I met Padre Killian four years ago. He's a Cistercian monk. He has taught me, um, among many other things, the importance of the existence of the body within a space. A monastery is ultimately The monastery is the quintessential domestic space. But most of all, we have learned on the individual, the body, and its relationships towards space and others.
A monk's existence is based on their spirituality. The first layer of their spirituality, the first externality, is the robe. That, that expresses the importance of the existence of the robe, its design, its presence, its thickness, and its weight. The second one is the cell. The cell with the monk builds its spirituality within itself, within its body, but towards the exterior. Then, they open a door and they found themselves in the cloister. The cloister is this space where they can find the relationship to the other. The necessity of that relationship relies on the, the mere existence of life. We are human beings. We are social animals. We cannot exist without the help of the other. The next layer is the monastery at large, the place where they relate to a, a more a collective community that maintains and sustains the space, both physically, but mostly for them spiritually. The church becomes this place of congregation where not only the, the internal Uh, community gets together, but then it includes the community outside. The outreach towards the community outside is the last layer of the, spirit, the spirituality of a monk. One of the most important things that I've learned through the monastery is the importance of that staging of relationships between one another that creates the possible community that really enables the understanding of collectiveness from the individual towards the outer world in stages. This is a set of relationships that exist in many communities, but in cities we have become binaries. It's either public or private. It's either individual or collective. It's either in and out. It's either concrete or natural. It's either one or the other, but existence is not either one or the other. It exists in various, many stages, many ways, many possibilities, and open through diversity. As I said before, the house is a fundamental architectural component, and we cannot understand it, understand it separately from all what it relies beneath it, on top of it, and of the belief because of it. We really should then allow just the house to exist as the only possibility defined mostly and in every country by the codes, by the norms and the administrative norms world worldwide. Do we really are going to be architects to understand that passive systems in sustainability mean to the ecology X, Y, and Z, while not understanding what a box does to our body. A year ago, I placed myself in the, in the moment where I could understood through my work that I was becoming one of those animals in the system that is just allowing the perpetuation for discrimination to, per, to pursue, to exist, and to survive. I understood then how important it is to question the house as a structure. As I said before, I'm going to repeat as long as is necessary, the house is a fundamental architectural component. 
that has structured our everyday life and define, defines relationships with our bodies and other people. The house is a space manipulated by social, political, and economical forces. Contemporary domestic environments are highly commoditized and shaped around formal preconceptions. Unfortunately, many of these preconceptions are in turn built into the local codes and administrative norms worldwide. In Mexico, a dignified and enjoyable housing to live is a constitutional right. While it is not the case everywhere, in many countries, the right to living space has become a law that precisely defines what a space is. However, in many cases, that dignified, enjoyable, and affordable space is defined by quantitative rather than qualitative aspects. A house, a unit, an apartment are defined by minimums. Minimum square meters, minimum amount of light, minimum ventilation, and conventional composition of spaces. Two bedrooms, two bathrooms, one bathroom, one living area, a kitchen, etc. In some cases, the law goes as far as to define the bed in location in relationship to a door or a window. These seemingly objective laws, which are drafted to ensure a safe and healthy living environment, reinforce conventional standards and discriminative domestic environments. Architectural practitioners and theorists have dedicated more than a century to pursue solutions that would provide the collective with what has been defined as the minimal and optimal conditions for living. In the best of the cases, This definition of minim, minimum is expressed in maximum. The entirety of their homes for those who live there in these so-called solutions. As a society, we're far from achieving a solution to the question of housing. In the present global conditions, the majority of the population do not have what is described in the codes as a decent place to live, let alone an enjoyable one. Let's assume we have a clever enough magical wind formula that allows us to achieve that we have what we have long been pursuing, what the law and codes define as a dignified and enjoyable housing for all, for every human being in the house in the world. Is really that the place where we want to live? Is that place where we can take care of ourselves? Are we really answering the correct question to begin with? We will be looking at the house in our studio for sure with completely different lens. We, will be, we, we are really trying to focus on various factors that encompass domestic life rather than the architectural form and constructability. We have been really analyzing why have we been designing for the only social structure that comprises almost the least of the structures possible in the world. How many families live to those conditions that, that apartments worldwide and houses worldwide provide? Two rooms, one bigger, one smaller, a kitchen, a living room, a dining room, and a bathroom. Is the nuclear family what we need? Is that the response for eliminating discriminative acts? I believe we really need to understand how to question that structure that has been the definitor of space throughout the world. We are trying to look to the house with other lenses with a vision to understanding what is the importance of each of the spaces in the house. We all need to sleep, but we all sleep differently. We all need to restore ourselves physically and mentally, but not all of us need the same ways. We really need this space that reconstitute our body and our mind, but not all of us need to share, to share it but we definitely need a place that will allow us to become our own selves, a platform that will enable the possibility for each human being in Earth 
to create their own existence. The same is with the bathroom. We all really, really appreciate the fact that we have that we have developed the technology in order to create a beautiful bathroom with all the fixtures around. But do, do we really need to encapsulate it in one space Some that sometimes doesn't even have natural illumination or ventilation? What about the bathroom as a social place? What about the rituals that happen there? Could this be the place where we could start understanding the importance of taking care of our body? Could we transform the function of it, of becoming a mere space for cleaning towards a space of bonding our intimate relationships? Could we think the bathroom as the next social space? What about the kitchen? Can't we really finally understand that the kitchen as a functional act is only perpetrating discriminative acts towards a person in the, in the house? We do all have to eat, but do we all have to sleep, to cook? We all need to feed ourselves, but do we really need to clean? When can we go back to the understanding that food it is also part of the important ritual that allows us to understand not only the necessity of taking care of ourselves, of nurturing our body to, for, to, to sustain its own existence, but the possibility of the relationship with others of taking care of the others, the act of taking care of the other. We have started to question that in many ways. First of all, in a project we did in, uh, in as developing a design strategy for the south of the country, where we already started questioning what does the kitchen needs to look like? Can we define a kitchen that becomes the space that anyone needs to have? Can we design a kitchen that is not fixed, but it's also movable? Maybe we want a kitchen that becomes outside, that becomes the outside, that defines the outside. It's not only about the kitchen. We, were th we, were, we have become an important question, which is, it is, It is about the house. It is about the living inside the house. We have started experimenting on the notion of the house as not only a predefined space that has functions that are to be filled. This determines a way of living. But what happens if we are only those designers of inspiring spaces that are just aesthetically very well defined and do allow for a lot to do. We developed this project in Spain where we define these small structures that are only giving the possibility of inhabiting, inhabiting a landscape but to do not prescribe what needs to happen in each of them. Can we architects think about the possibility of the architecture becoming a platform for each of on, own, us own existence. We were then given an opportunity to design a house in the Lake Edersee in Germany, nearby. The brief called for a house addressing the new ways of life. That being working and living in the same space. Note that this brief was given to us in 2017, pre-pandemic. Even then, I, also, I always thought that working and living was the way humans inhabit the world. It has only been 150 years, more or less, when we decided, and only in city centers, to divide the working spaces from the living spaces. 
I think finally we have come to a moment where, where that dichotomy becomes impossible, becomes the imposition that is really directing us to an unsustainable life. So then, do we need to still question what are the new ways of life? Or shall we just go back to the idea that there are as many ways of life as human beings in the planet, not only that, as moments in the human as moments of lives of the life of human beings in the planet. So therefore there are infinite possibilities of inhabiting a space, of living a space, of ways of life. So what we did in this project is we created this chart where we imagined these different scenarios. And we didn't want it to direct the space to one specifically one specific scenario, but we wanted to define those spaces in terms of the ambience that were really given by the fact that they have more light, that they are closer to the ground, that they are uh, more uh, in proximity to the ma to the landscape, that they are more reachable, that they are more compressed, that they are more interiorized that they are more self-reflective, that are more open, that are more express expressive, that are less expressive. And those spaces, in our understanding, promote certain things. But certainly, what we want to open is the possibility for everyone that inhabits this place to interpret it in their own ways. It already started with the process of design. So when we defined those six spaces, we did six collages. It already took a very long time of involvement of many members of the team to create those collages that would really transmit what we were truly and finally thinking. We finally arrived to this image and then we started defining the house. We arrived finally to a result that I, for years I thought it, it would have been the same if we have, would have started with the same premises. I tried to challenge the idea of following the brief uh, that would describe that we needed to do a house of 120 square meters with two bedrooms, one bathroom, one kitchen, one living space to start designing again the same way, to start labeling the lives of people. And what I did then, I thought it was again giving the same sense. But we very recently ago, a year ago more or less, we found out that we were really making a space that could be inhabited by anyone else, creating their own possibility for their existence. In a month, we're starting construction of this home in Germany. The new inhabitants decided to completely inhabit the place in a totally different way from which we had imagined, or at least what I had imagined. I haven't asked those members of the team who, who really did it. This really gave me a lot of joy and opportunity to think that we architects cannot define the existence of anyone else. And it's urgent that we really start, stop, stop, thinking that we can or that we have the ability of thinking how anyone else should inhabit this planet. Thank you very much. Hello again. Uh, this is a green screen behind me. We are still in Dashiko. No, I'm just joking. Um, uh, hello, now uh, after this inspiring lecture, lecture uh, of Tatiana Bilbao, we have a live talk with her. Uh, just uh, one reminder, on your left screen is a networking tab. So this is really a unique opportunity to ask questions. So now we can start. Hello, Tatiana. Welcome. Hello. Thank you very Hi, much. Hi, Tatiana. Thank you. Thank you for joining Hi. us here. Uh, and good morning to you. Uh, the dusk is setting here in Zagreb. Uh, thank you for I your. <laughs> thank you for your uh, really interesting uh, lecture, and you touched on some 
topics which um, have kind of pulled through the last 150 years or so, and you uh, bring it back uh, to the roots uh, of the issue. You talked about the monastery as a form of dwelling in its uh, purest form, stripped to the bare imprint uh, of a physical and spiritual uh, shelter. And on the other hand, um, a way of life is also a cultural expression uh, which manifests a representational message or a cultural message uh, in the house, uh, a message that the house conveys uh, as a place of ide identification or, uh, or an extension of oneself. Uh, so although we can view the house as an elastic concept, which is made up of um, a collection of the various places or values that it uh, represents. It speaks about the culture that it houses, and we can observe this culture very explicitly in vernacular architecture, but when we shift fast forward into minimum standards of uh, a more globalized uh, concept of what uh, a dwelling is, um, then we tend to brush over these cultural differences uh, in a way and promote stereotypes to some extent. So, uh, but again, when we talk about collective housing, we do have to talk about certain common denominators. So what is your priority in designing affordable collective housing? Yeah, thank you so much. So I think that's a very important question. And I think that um, recalling what Maria Giudici said once, and I um, listened, is that the house is one of the only types in architecture that de determinates the subject. No? So it creates subjectivity. And I think that this is truly uh, important to understand when we... Um, architects, policymakers, etc., are creating uh, these possibilities for many. So, so it has a good um, purpose, but at the end it's kind of hyper Machiavellic because we're it's not only creating stereotypes, it's determining modes of living, you know, and it's, um, and at, it, because of that, it's discriminating everybody, actually, you know? The, because it's standardizing the way we live in a standard that is generalized, which it doesn't exist normally, no, it exists in a very, very few ways. And some people could identify with some aspects, some others with others. So I think that it, it is a very difficult question how to understand that it, at the same time, trying to create equal and democratic access for everyone, giving opportunities to accept it, um, everyone's differences, no? to accept diversity. So I believe that one of the premises of collective housing should be to understand how can each individual could be part of the production of that dwelling. Um, maybe not physically, but culturally. No? How can uh, everyone be able to be represented in that space? So for me, that is the priority. It's very difficult when you uh, have an unknown subject or are not in contact direct with that. So then uh, maybe we should, as architects, policymakers, um, uh, politicians, economists, etc., should work with is towards the understanding of how to create those platforms so each individual is able to produce their own mode of dwelling. And... As I, say, I say I don't have the answer. It's an, a very important question that we all should uh, be doing it to ourselves right now. And for me, I think it has become super obvious because in a way the the standards have been created by a by a very um, you know white suprematist <laughs> vision. And when you're confronted in my context, this becomes super difficult, no? When you impose a way of living to a culture that is completely different from when, from what the culture that this set of rules or, or way of lived um, emerged, 
is very, very difficult. It's even more difficult, no? Because in a way, uh, when, where it was produced, where the thinking was done, was evolved, it had an evolution to arrive to the point where, where we are. But when that is exported to other places, it becomes an, an uh, immediate, um, obvious uh, representation of a, of, of a discrepancy, of a big discrepancy, no? Which happens in my context. And this is why it's, um, for me, very urgent and problematic, even that we were colonized by by where this thinking comes, no, more or less. But anyway, it's still uh, very kind of out from the culture that we live in. Um, um, in a way, like... A Two points are like or topics which are very interesting. The standard or normative and this cultural context. Like two, in a way, two opposites. Um, I was very intrigued uh, in your lecture with this um, diagram of the monastic expression of spirituality, which uh, is like a concentric uh, circles which uh, talk about these stages of the space, intimate to public. Uh, what is very interesting, um, in 60s, I have to show this, uh, in 60s, Edward Hall, the cultural anthropologist, um, um, made like this um, very interesting point, uh, which is now in pandemics very uh, wrongly quoted. Uh, so he um, uh, did his study which uh, was uh, talking about the social uh, distance, which is like uh, mathematically calculated uh, in meters, uh, that uh, talks about the intimate space and the public space. Also, after he did this diagram, which is like very mathematical, he said that it is really something which um, uh, belongs to every culture differently. And now in this pandemics, when we are like trying to find this universal normative, universal um, vaccine in, in a way, uh, or behavior in, um, in this era, how do you comment this trying to be universal in this crisis? And in a way, we totally agree that the cultural context is something that is like a priority. How to behave now? <laughs> this, is, this is something uh, incredibly interesting because I think there are many good things about globalization, but there is very, very uh, difficult things and dangerous things about it as well. No? And specifically, I would say that uh, also, I think this pandemic, uh, what it really does the most is exposing no all the all the issues that we were going li living up to it and uh, it is impossible to generalize solutions into the global world you know um, even in uh, in health issues as you were saying in in vaccine uh, possibilities in um, in policies about distancing about uh, closing and opening schools or ev uh, or businesses or whatever every locality needs to have that and we are losing the sense of locality uh, by by following the global no and and be, uh, by uh, i don't know i don't know if what is the deep part of the problem but i think that by by being being um, posed to respond not to global uh, to the global world to the global actually I would say is the economy no I would to the global capital uh, we need to then you know, align in some way with all with everything else. And I think that is one of the, the problems right now with democracy, that it's understood as a global thing, you no? Know? And it needs to become, democracy needs to come from its 
own place and it should be defined by its own people and not be applied as is applied elsewhere no and this is this extends to everything and we did a project uh, that we clearly understood this well we have been working in this project since 2005 where we clearly understood this um for a botanical garden in in a city named Culiacán where um, there was a very important art collector who wanted to uh, introduce pieces of his collection into the garden. And uh, I would say that neither the three of us, the curator, the the art collector and myself, were aware uh, in the beginning what we finally uh, understood like five or eight years um, onto the project, which was that um, we were able to create a place where people would interact with art in a in a way that they would never have been uh, able to do it in a museum. This culture, no? So if this art collector would have then thought, instead of uh, putting pieces in the botanical garden, which was kind of an intuition, thought of doing a museum, which was what was happening in the whole world, no? Let's do a museum in the city to to develop the city and bring art to it, uh, we would have really limited the possibility of people uh, interacting with art. Because in this culture, art is not part of an everyday um, action. It's not part of the culture and the city, is not part of the education. Is People don't live with art around themselves as in some other places, no? So going into a museum then becomes um, super um, kind of embarrassing and you don't want to go in because you feel um, ignorant. So we really wouldn't have been able to reach people through the message of art uh, in a place like a museum, but we were able to do it in full in a garden, in a more uh, everyday life's way. No? So this is exactly the example of, of that. No, We cannot apply the same solutions uh, to the same problems everywhere. And I, on the other hand, I believe that uh, commenting on the diagram, which I think it's uh, even more interesting about the anthropology uh, uh, anthropologist viewpoint is uh, the necessity of the understanding of the scaled uh, system of relationships that we do all have uh, universally as humans, no? But those types of relationships are which are very, very different, no? For um, us, Latin culture, uh, family becomes everything, you know, and we cannot have seven meters apart from our mother, no. But in a in a more northern culture, in in our own um, continent, no, in North America or in Canada, that is completely different. You want eight meters apart from your mom, right? But in Mexico, we want. 30 centimeters away from our moms. So it's it's very, um, what I say is we all have the same necessities, but we don't ride in the same boat. Uh, so we cannot uh, type, we cannot label them the same. Uh, thank you. I, I would actually like to pick up then on uh, the, these notions which uh, seem to be copy pasted uh, across countries and still uh, greatly defer, uh, and we touched about that uh, in the beginning. Um, first, there are differences between what is social housing, what is affordable housing, uh, what is low-cost co uh, housing, and how it relates to the market and uh, to what is government-subsidized. Uh, and uh, if we add to this uh, the concept of the right to dwelling or to the right to housing, uh, I'd like to know more uh, about that. For instance, in the EU, this is a topic which differs quite a bit uh, across the countries, but the EU Parliament voted in <clears throat> last December a motion towards a resolution uh, on access to decent housing uh, for all. And... Um, 
Recently here also a dear colleague of ours uh, published a book called Housing Policies in the Function of Social and Spatial Inequalities. Her name is Eva Marcetic. I'm sorry, the book is only in Croatian and speaks about this context. But it is very uh, local also what these uh, rights imply in a way. Uh, so could you tell us more about, uh, you mentioned in the lecture uh, that in Mexico there is uh, a policy or a right to dwelling, a constitutional right. Could you explain that more and how it is actually organized uh, and uh, built or secured? In Mexico, there is a constitutional right saying that every citizen has the uh, right to have a dignified and enjoyable place to live. That has translated into a law and the law uh, and mandates every person in government to uh, produce policy that uh, c provides the citizens with their right, no? So um, this has uh, taken a lot of forms depending on the governments, but basically since the 70s till today, it has um, kind of trans transformed into a system that was left to the private entities, so private developers. So today the result is, uh, in the beginning, the, the, the aim in the 70s was that the government realized that they were not able to um, catch up with the demand for housing uh, uh, for the people. So they were kind of teaming up in a way with private developers to be able to uh, produce more and more rapidly because the demand was increasing very quickly. But the problem was that today, fast forward 50 years, we have um, a, a system that is hyper commoditized and that the developers are the ones doing a huge business uh, with this. And the, the, what happens that the, the people end up with dwellings that are uh, just barely the minimum you know, the minimum of what the law uh, stated and uh, with the worst quality possible because the developers need to, need to uh, have the high earnings, no? So this is, um, and of course, in very cheap land, which is very far from, uh, from city centers. And this is one of the most important problems uh, of them all. And the, the worst part of the story is that through the last 20 years or 25 years, uh, more than 11 million homes were built and 40%, up to 40% are abandoned because they don't meet the qualities that anyone needs and has to live. So I believe that there is a very important um, uh, um, fact that I believe that in every country, the right to live should be a right, constitutional right. Not in every country is a constitutional right. It has been declared by the UN as a human right um, because that it's one of the most important necessities for our, for our existence. We need to have a roof on top of our heads, otherwise we cannot survive. So I think that uh, it should definitely be that. Um, and then, but the problem becomes when this translates no, into the real thing that it's built for everybody. And this is exactly what happened in Mexico. No? So the right translated into a law the law created minimums in order to, you know, kind of say, well, this is the minimum that the definition could allow to become the dignified and durable housing. And the problem is that then the implementation brought the, the issue that the, those minimums became maximums. And not only that, because then uh, there's a lot of qualities um, attached to those minimums. Uh, those interpretations of those qualities depend on the, on the on the real estate developers who need to earn money. So, I think that the problem is the implementation. No? Then there, at least in our country, that's the problem. Uh, maybe like uh, we can comment like it's similar uh, in our country also. I like when I uh, think. Uh, 
about the past, how we wanted to be so smart, defining this existence minimum. We like uh, thought that we are so smart, like yes, the existence minimum, the, the smallest uh, the uh, apartment, the smallest uh, house, like yes, we don't have to build a big one. Um, we will also, uh, in our faculty, uh, uh, we will learn like, if you uh, do a good design of a small apartment or a small house, you can do the big one. And now this existence minimum is like against us in a way that like it's used for a maximum, which you are talking all the time. Like, uh, yeah, we were not so smart then. <laughs> <laughs> so, <Exactly>. in a way, <laughs> okay. But um, when we talk about this uh, uh, pol, we okay. We talk now about the policies, and now this uh, theme of this uh, affordable housing, all the themes which are very uh, like uh, now very um, um, important in a way of the topics of climate change, uh, in the topics of uh, inequalities also. Um, we talk about some uh, direct contacts, uh, uh, contacts uh, with our uh, use, uh, future users, our clients. And now also, um, we have this world which, okay, I'm referring also on this pandemics. We don't have this anymore. And we want to talk about uh, like one-to-one -one with the other person. And this is totally like right to do that. Um, how can, uh, I want to hear like your comment on this um, distancing and trying to explain like we are not uh, the, the agent uh, architect as an agent from uh, bottom up person, not the one here. Um, are we like uh, not in the right position now because of this also pandemics and trying to do everything digital? Can we like manage in this world? Yes. Um, so I believe that uh, we we should think not the architect as the agent, but architecture, the agency of architecture. You no, know? and I think that that is one of the things I I've been trying to unlearn because obviously I learn differently. Is to how to think that is not the architect who needs to define those things, but how there was architecture could be that, no? And how could we not be the architect, but do architecture? And I think there is a huge uh, difference in those notions. Um, and as I said, I grew up with the notion of architect as the agent. So I'm trying to translate all what it, that means. And I still believe that I haven't comprehended the full, full length on how to transform that into uh, architecture as agency and n me not being the architect, me being part of the architecture. And I think that um, uh, one of the most uh, important things is because of what you're saying. And it's not because only of the pandemic and the digital world, but in truth, and if we are honest, we can never uh, become the other to, to build. No, So if we're speaking about representation and listening and representing uh, that other who's going to live, we, we need to be honest with ourselves that we cannot truly become that other or, or to under, even start to understand that other to do uh, anything for them. And I believe that it's not for them, it's being them. And we cannot do that. So how? I think that by allowing a platform to uh, be the architecture who becomes the agent for that, existence, then we would change the possibilities, no? So starting to think how not to, to so you were saying we were uh, taught to do the existence minimum, no? Well, we also were taught to, to think that we could define what is that existence minimum, no, for someone else. But for me, it might be very, very different from what is for you. So how can we then allow each of us to to create their own possibility of existing in this space. Um, we have also uh, know that uh, generic would not work. 
would because it uh, generic but labeled would not work. That's what I think modernism brought us. No, so we created very functional spaces that we thought they were. Um, kind of tackling the, the most uh, important uh, like functions that we needed in a dwelling. And, you know, we labeled them, we created specific rooms for them. But those functions, yeah, we all do need to eat. We all do need to wash ourselves and take care of our bodies. Do We all do need to sleep, but we don't all need to do them in the same way, you know. So that is the thing. How can we erase Uh, the labels, the adjectives, and leave the the space for the verbs to happen. I don't have the answer. I'm looking for it. <laughs> This is a really important yeah. issue, and it, it seems to trigger uh, also the audience because we have a question uh, from the chat related to the agency of the architect or the agency of architecture. Uh, do you think that this year Pritzker Prize winners Lakaton and Vassal is a sort of, sort of a statement towards the shift uh, in a way that this is maybe redefining a role uh, of the architect? It is a question by Andrea from the chat. Well, I definitely was very happy to hear that Lakaton and Vassal were the, the selected ones. I believe that... Um, What is for me very important about the message is that architecture doesn't need to be uh, this hyper fancy um, a result of a, an object, an optical element that appears in a city, but something that is really thought to improve the quality of life of people. No, And I think that uh, is not through invention or innovation, is through true uh, ethical values behind. So this means that you can renovate a beautiful uh, a building and become something really uh, a place where people could dwell, no, and not necessarily cre create a new uh, pink, very shiny object uh, uh, to 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 create spectacle to to do architecture. So I think that yeah, for me that is the message. For me, um, uh, definitely, uh, I like to to see also that they are working in a very privileged context uh, for those who don't have the same privilege. No, so uh, I believe that it is um, it is a message in many many ways. I I do uh, believe that uh, still it could be even pushed forward, um, but I believe that this is already the start of a very important message, and I believe that taking it forward, pushing it forward, means how that then is not like a ton and basal, but is the building that they did that win the Prisker. Why um, why not we start thinking that instead of architects, me being speaking here, sorry, but <laughs> I have to say this, you interview the dwellers, no? If the magazines would feature the people who use the architecture to describe the architecture, we would become really, truly much better architects. That's a very good point because it also uh, directs to the question of how we communicate architecture. Uh, not only among ourselves, but to a wider audience, because we somehow got lost in the, as you said, shiny object of uh, the simulated reality of the render of the beautiful picture, uh, and so on. Absolutely, yeah, the, no, and I think that... Uh, sorry. No, 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 continue, continue. <laughs> It's a, no, a, that a I question. do believe that we need to start to change how we speak, how we see and how we represent architecture ourselves, the architects, no? And then, and then we will be able to, to change it, uh, how we communicate it. And as I said, we could start by featuring, uh, by letting the buildings and the dwellers to speak and not the architects. That, that will change already completely the vision. Uh, we also have one uh, question from the audience. Uh, from uh, Yurica. Uh, his question is, you have a very expressive opinion regarding 3D photorealistic renderings, but your way of representation is also computer-aided photomontage. What is the difference? 
for me, one uh, render that depicts uh, a specific moment and, uh, and a specific uh, of the specific uh, project uh, is a very um, one way vision. It is very static. And for me, the, the thing is not about how the medium is used, it's about what the image uh, um, communicates. And for me, a, a, a collage is already saying that it's an assemble of things, which always everything is an assemble of things, but in a way that it's an assemble of things that accepts more uh, diversity, no, and accepts not only diversity within the interpretation because uh, a collage is able to be interpreted in different ways, which an image is very difficult to be interpreted in many different ways, could be, but not uh, as diverse as a collage that is um, could be read in in even more ways. And I think that a collage also accepts other voices, no, so it's kind of always an open ended. Uh, image that you are in your mind, or at least me, but I think many people, because I've asked, no, uh, uh, thinking, okay, I would not put this image there. I would change it here. I can put this. I can add these. I imagine these other scenarios, and uh, and this is the type of dialogue that I think it starts to open with an image that is uh, composed by many different parts, um, which I don't think an, uh, a static image of a render does. This also like um, consists of this statement that building, when it's built and it's equipped, it's not finished. Like the building has its life also, like this small picture with render or collage. Uh, this is like very consistent in a way of architecture. And I also think that uh, when you think that that image is a you know a render uh, has the blondie girl no with the hair blown out and and stating the way the the furniture is placed uh, how every the light should be and everybody's aiming no that the building would work like that and should be inhabited like that and even directing that no I remember perfectly a guy who said well. Uh, but you, you, in the image, the, 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 the painting was not this one. And I was like, well, yeah, but it doesn't matter. It was just a painting. No, that's the, when the moment I realized this is, this is wrong because I am, uh, he genuinely wanted to inhabit the space as I depicted, not because he was, he was, he was torn to that. He liked the image, whatever. But then I thought this is very dangerous because you are really directing how the space should be used, it should be interpreted, and then it doesn't become a dialogue. I, I think that there, there is an imperative necessity of going back to, towards the idea that architecture needs to uh, be this conversation with everyone that uses it and not a monologue or I mean position from someone that creates it. Two-sided, not one-sided. Yeah. Yes, yes. And also uh, not to halt the conversation at the point of uh, the building being finished, but actually to begin the conversation then when it's, exactly. once it's uh, inhabited. Actually, a Croatian architect who opened the festival yesterday, Vedra Nairgic, uh, uh, began with this. What is the imprint of life into a generic framework? She uh, showed housing from the 60s in Zagreb where each apartment was fundamentally different depending on the personal expression of the people inhabiting it. And it creates new lives uh, within this generic framework. So perhaps uh, to conclude here, because we started with a normative and we're ending at the personalized normative. No. Um, <laughs> We would like to thank you very much no. for this uh, inspiring talk because I think that... And lecture. Yes, and the lecture we uh, touched on some uh, fundamental uh, questions of what we do and how we do it and uh, the, the worlds that we create through it and the responsibility of, uh, of our work. Thank you very much, no, Tatiana. Very it was much. a true pleasure to yeah, meet you. Really. Thank you so much, the same. I hope I can meet you personally very soon.
Yes. So, like, we make this, uh, uh, how, uh, 30 centimeters distance is in Mexico? <laughs> like, you know, we exactly. Balkans do it the same. So, yeah. it's okay with us. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Bye and thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. bye.